Welcome to the Physique Development Muscle Series. In this special series, we're breaking down the science and art of training each muscle group. Each episode is dedicated to a specific muscle, providing you with expert insight into its function, dispelling common training misconceptions, and highlighting our go-to exercises that deliver results. We'll also share key execution cues to help you perfect your technique and maximize your gains. Get ready to elevate your training game and achieve your fitness goals like never before. Let's dive into delts. I am excited that we are diving into delts today. Delts are actually one of my favorite, favorite muscles visually, and I love training delts. And even recently started working up my arm for my sleeve, and I was like, do not cover my delt because I love my delts and I've worked far too hard for them. So I'm jazzed about this. Delts are m one of my favorite muscle groups to train. I feel like as we get through this series, I'm going to be saying this a bunch. But <laughs> <laughs> Literally. I'm be like, Glutes are my favorite. Quads are my favorite. <laughs> Chest is my favorite. I, I enjoy delts for the sheer fact of my delts have been something that um, have taken me some time to grow. Uh, as a dedicated physique development podcast listener, you guys know that I have come from being skin and bones, basically. <laughs> so every muscle group has felt that way to some degree. And delts, most specifically, were ones that took me a while to, to add some tissue that I'm still working on. Yeah, well, they are bigger than my head. So I think that you've done <laughs> quite, a quite a good job. What a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mia said the same thing when she saw you. That's so. very sweet. It's very sweet. I'm still chipping away at it, though. <laughs> Uh, but let's go ahead and dive into what delts do and why they're important. So for today's conversation, we're going to be focusing solely on anterior delt and the medial or lateral head of the delt. With the rear delt, we're going to have that in another episode with the upper back because that's going to be better for us when we're talking about the functionality as well as the exercises that we would be performing for them. The delts are involved in almost every function of the upper body. You are trying to train something in the upper body, the delts are going to be involved in some form or fashion. And when we're talking about the anterior or lateral head of the deltoid, it is going to be contributing to the function of raising our arm to the side or raising the arm out in front of us. When we talk about the anterior delt and want to utilize anatomical terms, it is going to contribute to flexion of the shoulder and a slight degree of adduction, adduction of the upper arm. When it comes to the medial or lateral head of the deltoid, it is going to be abduction of the arm or the arm moving away from the body. And as I said, both of these muscle groups are contributing to so many functions of our day-to-day -day life. If Do you have a, a couple of daily activities that <laughs> either the anterior delt or the medial delt are going to be contributing to? Yeah. So if you are unloading your dishwasher and going ahead and putting the glasses in the cabinet, you're going to go ahead and use that front or that anterior delt. As well as if you have little kids and you're picking them up, that's going to be using that front delt as well. Um, in that process. And one thing I really want to mention, and we'll probably mention it throughout this series, is that no muscle works in isolation. So while there is going to be a lot of front delt within raising your child up, it's not that you're not using any other muscle group. It is going to be the main mover there, but there are going to be different muscle groups involved as well. Sure. Nothing is going to work in, in full isolation. But when we talk about the lateral head of the delt, I would say life factors or life things that you're doing is picking up groceries, mm -hmm. picking up the laundry hamper. Both those things can be super heavy. And I, <laughs> and I know that everyone listening is going to be team one trip from the car with their groceries. <laughs> and is there any other way? <laughs> stren strengthening that medial delta is going to be a big part of that. Now, when it comes to visual changes to someone's body and growing the medial or anterior delt, what are some of the things that um, you see or, or will happen with those improvements? You get that that nice little cap little look. Cap. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't feel like your arm just like goes down. You have more shape. You have more tone to your arm because you have that that little cap there little from cap. your delt. Yeah. <laughs> By creating larger delts, it's also going to allow for you to appear as having a smaller waist. So if you feel like you have a very boxy waist, 
you know, structurally, you may be stuck with it. It may just be the, the case for you. But a way that you can kind of work to change that is increasing the width to your shoulders. Now, for the short kings out there, the guys who really struggle and they're like, man, I wish I was just a couple inches taller. By creating more width to your shoulders, you're going to appear taller. You don't have to put on heels. You don't have to have any special shoes. Just create more muscle density. And all of a sudden, you're going to be like, I'm about two, three inches taller. <laughs> the ladies are going to be noticing right yeah, away. Of course. <laughs> and I know that there's one thing that you really like when it comes to appearance-wise, and it's the way that your clothes fit. Oh, amen. <laughs> amen. It is, it is the key to truly filling out a shirt. Because if you fill out a shirt sleeve and it fits around your bicep and tricep, but you don't really have the the delt cap or pop there, then it's just a straight line down. And so the shirt just kind of doesn't really give you the, the full look. By having that delt, it really allows for the shirt to fit you perfectly. Yes. And there have been many times when we've been like out at restaurants and people have complimented you being jacked or your arms or your delts because of the way that your arm and delt is pressing against your t-shirt sleeve. Now, of course, the oversized look is different. You're not necessarily going to fill that out. But for your day-to-day t-shirts, it really gives a full look uh, and just is a really good look. Well, thanks so much. This, I didn't <laughs> this know this is just all about compliments <laughs> for Alex. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know this was going to be a full hype obsession for me. But uh, someone who does fill out the oversized tee would be like Seabum. Seabum yes. <laughs> still has that delt cap <laughs> when he's wearing the oversized yes. tees. And I will say for women listening to this, it is just so nice because l- we will talk about more of that rear delt and that upper back and what that looks like and just your back as a whole. But not only can it help make your waist appear smaller, but but it is just going to help again with that shape of, like you said, your arm doesn't go just straight down. And even though I've worked really hard on growing my delts, I don't have like these massive capped delts on my arm. So I think that some people fear working out their delts too much of being like too jacked. And I can tell you like no one's accidentally gotten too jacked. And so it's something that I feel like a lot of my clothes and shirts and dresses just give a better look. But I will make a quick disclaimer that I went through a phase where I was putting on dresses that I hadn't worn in a while. And I was like, I'm leaner than I was when I wore these last. Why are these so short on me. And I realized I grew my glutes and I grew my delts. So growing my delts, those dresses lifted a little bit. And same with the glutes of it lifted that dress up. So it was a little bit shorter. So I will say that if you have some short dresses and you grow your delts, might be a little bit too short. (laughs) It's a good problem to have. Though. It is a good problem to have, but I do think that it is a disclaimer that needs to be made. <laughs> and I'll also add that the clients that I work with who are getting ready for their wedding, yeah. one of the biggest things that they want to have, because many of them are going to have their shoulders showing in their wedding dress, is that they want their shoulders to look amazing. They want to be in the photo of when they're finally kissing their now husband for that delt to be popping. And they that's one of the first things that they point out when they send me photos from their wedding is like, look at my arm. Then it's like, look at my glutes. But that's another episode <laughs> that we'll dig into. Low reps is best. High reps is best. Fruit is so it's good. It's terrible for you. You should lift heavy. High reps, Carbs low are weight. needed. Keto Squats are bad for your Squats needs. are great You should squat astrograms. It's fine. It Macros fits my macros. It's for idiots. When there are so many mixed messages going around, it's hard to know what you should even do or focus on. But that's exactly where physique development one-on-one coaching comes in. You might have heard of online coaching or even high a coach before, but we believe in teaching you the why behind what we do while truly taking your life into consideration. We want to train, educate, and empower you to reach your goals and help you to stop spinning your wheels and just finally feel good. And hey, we're here to help you look good too. You need you. Your health is your wealth. So join Physique Development and let us be the last coach you ever need. Now that you guys are fully aware of how amazing you can look by growing your delts. Let's talk about some of the benefits that you will have structurally and within your body when uh, growing this muscle tissue. Yeah, you're going to be able to have some better posture once your delts and being able to just work on your upper body as a whole is going to help with your posture. But those delts can definitely help with just making sure that you're not having this slumped forward look. You're being able to have that better posture overall and better posture is going to allow you just to 
feel better as a whole. Uh, I know that sometimes I get caught and I see myself and I'm all crunched over. Uh, but once you have that better posture, not only we talked about it in a past episode of that can make you look better and present a lot better of having good posture. And that's one easy thing that you can change. Uh, but it can also, again, help with the way that those clothes are looking when you have that correct posture. And another thing, it's just going to strengthen all of the muscles near the shoulder. The shoulder girdle is actually a pretty small thing that's happening in your body. And it's something that once you're able to build up that strength around it, it can just help with a lot of those upper body movements, like you mentioned, because it's involved in so much upper body that being able to strengthen it is only going to help. With all of those benefits for shoulders, what are some of the favorite exercises you program for clients or personally enjoy doing? Okay. So for clients, we'll, we'll, we'll start with the anterior delt. For clients, I really like a cable anterior front raise. I really enjoy using the cable because there's more consistent tension, whereas with the dumbbells, which is still a great option, utilizing the dumbbells, we're going to have a drop off in that tension. Um, so if the individual is strong enough, because the cables are going to be more challenging than the dumbbells, um, I like to use the cable anterior front raise is my number one. What is, what is your number one? I'd probably say the either prone dumbbell front raise or an anterior dumbbell press. I love pressing movements. I love raising raises as a whole, but I really enjoy pressing movements just because then you can really push the gauntlet on how much weight you can do. And I just feel like that anterior delt press is such a fun one to really get after. I love that. And one thing I will give you guys a little golden nugget on is that with your anterior delt raises too often individuals are just raising their arm straight up as i talked about at the beginning there's going to be a slight degree of adduction um, included with that anterior delt and so if you're doing those front raises think about your bicep punching yourself in the chin <laughs> relative to being outside of your ear that will allow for you to better shorten that anterior delt when going through those exercises um, so we, we talked about the, the shoulder press. We talked about the anterior delt raise. There's really not a whole lot beyond <laughs> those two exercises with these muscle groups. We're going to have a short list of exercises that we can get creative with within the rep schemes and those different things, but it's not going to be that we have a, a laundry list of, of exercises that are available to us. So really the cable and then the prone dumbbell front raise. And the reason that I like the prone dumbbell front raise is that it just puts our body into a better position to train the anterior delt and have a long time under tension because of how we're aligned on the bench. Further, it takes out the momentum that someone may have when just standing, because it's very easy for us when we're just standing and starting to get into a fatigue state to just shrug up with our shoulders and use the traps more to create that momentum. And by being leaning into that bench, it puts us in a place where we're not able to do that near as easily. So going on to the medial delt, I'll go ahead and go first so you don't take mine dumbbell lateral raise. That's just the best. I want to do those every single day, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so dumbbell lateral raise, just regular. Yeah, I love it. Okay. So I actually like a behind the back cable lateral raise probably the most. I also like a, a cable Y raise or a dumbbell Y raise. Mm -hmm. um, though, yeah, I guess those three would be my my favorite. I, I like the chest support and the lateral raise for the same exact reason I talked about with the uh, dumbbell front raise. I, I like that as well. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the you know the dumbbell overhead press where you're working more of that medial delt instead to, of that to a degree. Delt. Like you're uh, with the the medial delt, it's going to be certainly a contributing factor in, in both of the the presses, but. In lengthening the medial delt, I think that the best option for us is to go with the behind the back cable lateral raise, mm -hmm. because that's really going to be the only position that the insertion and the origin get the furthest degree away from each other under tension. And so I, I find that to be the, the best option. So now that I know the exercises that you enjoy, how do you fit those into a client's program or how do you program those? 
This is a, an interesting one because what we've seen from a research perspective is that they can recover faster than some of the larger muscle groups if you think about lats or chest or, or quads. And there isn't a conclusive reason as to why that is the case. I think that it, in my opinion, is probably going to be from the sheer fact of it being involved in so many different movements and its necessity to be able to recover that quickly because it's so involved. And so you're able to spread the volume nicely throughout your week but you have to be cognizant of how it is being utilized in other exercises. So you need to understand how much pressing are you doing? How much pulling are we performing? And make those notes. And if you're tracking the total amount of sets that you're programming, I there, there's not a, a one size fits all of like, if it's this particular exercise, you should track it as a fourth of a set mm -hmm. or like a half of a set. It's more so being mindful and erring on the side of having less total sets for your direct um, medial delt or anterior delt, especially if you have a lot of pressing being involved in your training is probably a good idea. And so what I would recommend is to have a good quantity of those lateral raises involved because the medial delt is not going to have a ton of love in some of the other movements that we're talking about within the pressing and the pulling. It's going to get some, but it's not going to have the direct work that the anterior delt may be getting in a lot of your pressing and the rear delts may be getting in a lot of your pulling. And so if you want to start at a place from a total set allotment of, let's say, six to eight total sets across your week as a starting point, and then being able to tighten that up, maybe even into 12 or 14 total sets, depending on where you're recovering, is a good place for you throughout the entirety of a, a program that you may be writing. And it's always helpful to err on the side of a little bit lower volume because it's so much easier to increase volume than once you've gone overboard with volume, then you're under recovered and then trying to find what the sweet spot is, where I feel like it's much easier just to add on a few sets and gradually see where is this threshold, how can I recover from this and what feels the best. Absolutely. The biggest thing is the recovery Yeah, because you're going to find that if you do try to spread it over three days of your five days of training, let's say you're going to really have to be cognizant of that recovery, making sure that your nutrition and all recovery factors are taken into deep consideration. Um, because if you're just continuously pounding away at a muscle tissue that's never recovering, you're never going to really see the results that you're seeking. Do you think that possibly because the shoulder is smaller and just the muscles in the shoulder are smaller is why you can recover it from more than something like quads or glutes? Um, even on a, a deeper level of my opinion, I think that some of the research is in part to people not training it well <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair. and doing a lot of like shrugging and not having as much of isolation as they believe to have. And so I think that is part of it. I also, as I said, within the, the contribution of needing to have that recovery, I think that that's you know, part of it as well. Yeah. I think that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so with programming, what does it look like when it comes to common mistakes that you see? Because, I mean, we've looked at thousands of clients' training videos and being able to go through the execution of those videos. So what are those big mistakes that you see? The first one being the overemphasis of load selection. Like they get too married to the fact of like, I need to go up and wait and I need to use as heavy as possible. And the, the heavier that I do this movement, the better off that I'm going to be. And often we have to shift the emphasis back to execution, correct a lot of their executional errors within a, a lateral raise, for example, or even an anterior delt raise. Going back to the execution, nailing the execution, and then being able to progress load from that point. Mm -hmm. I was even looking at a video for me back in college and I was like, oh my gosh, I was doing so much more weight. But when I thought back to it, I wasn't actually getting tension on the muscle. And so I think that it's a question I have clients ask themselves and I ask my myself is just, can you lift it or are you getting the tension on the muscle? Because I can lift heavier than I lift, but I'm not actually getting tension on the muscle that I'm trying to. And that doesn't really mean anything. If you're using other muscles to compensate or if you're just thinking about getting from point A to point B, you're not going to see the improvements and you can actually see a lot of 
pain and discomfort and issues you have to fix down the line from trying to just increase the weight all the time, where it's obviously needs to be a part of it, of having progression and challenging yourself. But I think it's being able to really think, am I actually getting tension on the intended muscle? Do I even know what muscle I'm working with this movement? I'll add to that and say that it is a muscle group that just takes a little bit more time for you to increase the weight that you're using. Yes. I think that this is a, a big part of the puzzle is that you may be doing the same weight for the same amount of, of repetitions on a lateral raise for much longer than any other exercise. Now, that is for good reason because the, the weight that you are utilizing is lower than what you may be comparing to in your mind. And I have a, an example that comes to mind at the moment. If you were to, let's say you're using 20 pound dumbbells for your lateral raise and the next available dumbbell at your gym is the 25s. You're doing sets of eight to 10. And so you're like, man, I just, I want to go up to the 25s, but I'm only able to get a couple of repetitions. The reality of it is, is that if you go up to the 25s, you're making a 25% increase to the total amount of weight that you are lifting for the entirety of the set, not just for one or maybe two repetitions, for the entirety of the set. And another example of this would be if you were to go in and do RDLs and we're, we're training the glutes, you are using 60 pound dumbbells and you're wanting to go up to the 65s. That is only a 8% increase. And so if you're trying to compare to like, well, I'm going up much faster in my RDLs and my bench press and these different movements, it's like, they're not an apples to apples comparison because of the total load that we're lifting per set. And so always keep that in mind. And it's just one of those, because the weight that we're using per exercise or per set is lower, the increase when we go up to the next weight or we go to the next pinned weight on a stack, that's going to be a much larger percentage increase than what you would see with other exercises. That is an incredible point. And it's something I always remind clients that when it comes to lateral raise or flies or anything where you're that far away, the weight is that far away from your body, it is actually so much more tension. So if you think of, okay, I'm doing lateral raises with a 10 pound dumbbell, but when it comes to doing any kind of shoulder press, I can go to like a 30 pound dumbbell. It's because that 10 pound dumbbell, that full arm's length away can be 30 or 50 pounds of tension on your actual delt. So I think people see those smaller numbers and they're thinking, oh, I'm not progressing or I, I lift such a small amount when truly that far away from your body when you're thinking of some of those other movements, that weight is a lot closer and you can feel a lot stronger with that. Amen. Uh, another common mistake that I see with people doing their lateral raises is that they try to like lock down their shoulders. Yes. They're like, I don't want to move my traps and I don't want to move my scapula and I'm going to somehow do my lateral raise where the scapula is going to need to be able to fan out as you are raising your arm and your arm going away from you. Your scapula needs to be able to move. And so if you are someone who is like, I can't, I, I have to lock this down. And, and um, as you can see, I'm not moving my upper back. <laughs> <laughs> If you were like that, you're probably thinking, man, I can't really raise my arm. There's just a, a point where I can no longer continue to raise my arm. That's because you're not allowing for the arm to function as it needs to. And so we need to allow for that movement to transpire for you to get the tension that you're needing to that shoulder. And I will also add that for the individuals who are locking things down and, and being so rigid with their execution, you may feel like when you diet, you lose your delts because the hypertrophy that you are creating to the, the delt is more metabolic or, or sarcoplasmic, if you will. So you're getting a lot of sugar and glucose being pushed to the muscle belly, but you're not actually creating greater density to the muscle tissue because it's not being able to function properly. And so then when you diet and you get into a calorie deficit, you find yourself in the situation of like, oh, I've lost my delts. I've got to get out of this or I need a refeed. I yeah. need to refeed immediately. And then you refeed and then you get the pot back and you're like, I knew it. It's like, no, no, no. You need to go back in the lab and you need to train hard for an extended period of time to actually grow your delts as you uh, want to. A hundred percent. I think another thing is even just assessing like active range of motion where 
people are thinking, I can get it to this point, but you want to think about, again, where that origin and insertion is and where you're actually trying to move that. So we are going to have a cheat sheet for each muscle series so you can visually see where the origin and insertion is because that was a game changer for me when it finally clicked in my head of, oh, it makes sense that I'm moving in the scapular plane instead of just straight to the side because of where things originate and insert on my delt. And it allowed it to be a lot more clear of you don't have to know all of the terms of, okay, I know exactly the name of the thing that it originates and inserts at. But if you generally can see and visually see, then that's going to allow you to execute that and then also be able to understand what that range of motion needs to be when you have that weight involved. Yeah. We, th- we thought that if we went through and talked about the insertion, the origin of <laughs> all of these muscle groups, that it would be more confusing than beneficial as you guys are listening to this. Mm-hmm. So I think the cheat sheet will be a tremendous aid. Um, so that's in the show notes right now. Mm-hmm. And you can click that and use that as a visual representation as we talk through these things. And I think that, like you said, it'll be a massive help for everybody. Mm-hmm. Are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing? turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty. I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal, grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s able to grow their glutes with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one clients. And that changes today. We just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program. Because you are awesome and I want you to have this program, I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. And another thing what I see within training is sometimes that people aren't recognizing, again, how the body works together. So like the example you used of locking things down, of you'll, I used to have like a pinch on the right side when I was doing pressing movements. And a big part of that was the way that I was breathing wasn't to allow my lungs to fully get enough air. And so it was causing like this pinching movement and just being able to learn to breathe a little bit more allowed space for that shoulder to move freely. And so it's not always of, I just need to do this exercise and just keep on doing it. Sometimes it's taking a step back and assessing what does the full picture look like? Are there other things at play that is causing this to not be able to move forward? Absolutely. Do you have any other training mistakes or common things that you see from clients? I would add, because I've, I've talked about it a little bit as we've gone through the episode, but utilizing momentum far too much because in lateral raises or front raises, it's very easy for us to get just a little bit of a rock and some momentum and utilizing the eccentric portion of both of those exercises. And so the lowering of the weight of both of those exercises as kind of this catapult for us to get a little bit of a, a stretch reflex or a bounce out of the bottom. And so the more that you can continue control the eccentric. And this is going to go for every single muscle group that we talk about throughout this series is that if we can have better control through the eccentric portion, we're going to gain greater hypertrophy and also be able to avoid a possibility of, of greater injury because I have seen injuries transpire within um, lateral raises or anterior delt raises and people swinging the weight and getting some form of impingement or something along those lines. And so having that control is going to be tremendously beneficial. Now, can momentum be a useful tool in the training? Yes. Yes, it is going to be something that as you're going through training and and it being strategically utilized in the program design can certainly be beneficial to you, but it's not something that we're going to use at absolutely every single set and every single rep that we do. And the other thing with momentum is you can end up 
working another muscle group right. instead of the intended muscle group. So you're like, man, I do all these lateral raises and my my delts aren't shit. And then my traps are incredible. And it's like, because you're really doing a lot of trap work as you go through that with that momentum. Absolutely. I think one last thing that I'll say is the forearm angle and allowing your triceps to take over. I see that a lot, especially for an overhead press, is that someone's forearm and the dumbbell is more towards the head. And whether they are going through the eccentric or the concentric, and it puts it in a place of if that forearm isn't directly over that elbow, then you're actually deloading some of your delts and putting more on your triceps. So that's another example of you're not truly understanding the movement, and then you are causing that to put tension on other muscle groups. Yeah, absolutely. Paying attention to the forearm angle uh, is going to be tremendously helpful within your presses for sure. Now, I have some questions um, from the people that I thought that we could go over real sure. quick. Let's hear it. All right. Do front delts need isolation to grow? It depends. It depends on how much pressing you're doing. Mm -hmm. If you are like myself, I have a lot of pressing in my training right now because I really want to grow my chest. The amount of direct isolation work I need for my anterior delt is pretty slim because they're going to be a large contributor to all of my presses. Now, if you are a female who is, well, male or female who is not pressing a bunch, it probably would be a good idea for you to do more isolation work. One place that I use a lot of anterior delt isolation work is for my clients who have breast augmentations and they're not able to or do not want to press as much and they're still wanting to have that shape and fullness to their delt. And so having more isolation work for their anterior delt is very important. Are front delts push or pull? Are front delts push or pull? Mm -hmm. It is going to be push. <laughs> that was the question. Okay. Just throwing it out there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be pushing. <laughs> Do side delts or lateral delts help improve bench press? help improve bench press. They're not going to be a large contributor. I think that it would be naive to say that they have no contribution whatsoever because how the the muscle is going to uh, insert and um, originate, there's not going to be a ton of contribution, but I do believe that there's some. Uh, I, I don't think that if you are like, I want to grow my medial delt and all I'm going to do is bench press is really the answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I certainly think there's going to be, you know, some play that they're going to have in there. How to grow side delts with calisthenics, or can you grow your side delts with calisthenics? I am not well versed in calisthenics. Um, I would imagine because I've seen so many individuals do that on um, Instagram and all of it that, I mean, a lot of their work because it is body weight and they're jumped around on jungle gyms and doing crazy stuff that their medial delt is going to be working quite often in that. So I would say for sure. And then are delts and shoulders the same thing? Delts and shoulders are for sure the same thing. Do you have anything else that you would want to tell someone who is learning about their front or side delts or anything that you feel like we haven't covered yet? I don't think so. <laughs> I do not think so. I, I, I feel like we covered everything. Well, I don't either. So we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Again, there is going to be a cheat sheet in the show notes. It is not only going to be able to show you a visual of the origin and insertion, but also have some of the things from this podcast written down. So some of our favorite exercises. There's also going to be a playlist on our YouTube channel, which will be linked on the cheat sheet of all of the videos we have going over delt movements. So if you're like, well, you talked about doing things wrong and I'm not sure how to do things right, we have videos specifically going over each movement. But if you have any further questions, like please feel free to comment, send us an email, whatever it may be, because we would love to be able to make sure that we have something to provide for you and to answer that question. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the muscle group series and we'll catch you in the next one.